So we're very fortunate today to have as our guest speaker, Amalia Gastaldelli, all the way from Italy, uh, coming to visit us. Uh, she is a world-known uh, expert in metabolism and uh, insulin resistance and fatty liver disease. Uh, Amalia is, uh, received her uh, PhD at the University of Padova in biomedical engineering in Milan and then continued on to get a PhD in preventive medicine and community health uh, with a major in human physiology uh, at the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Texas Medical Branch of Galveston, uh, Texas with Bob Wolf, who is one of the fathers of stable isotope. Currently, she is the director of the Cardiometabolic Risk Group in the institution, uh, Institute of Clinical Physiology at uh, CNR of PISA, that's the Research National Network or Council in Italy. Uh, and since 2002, she's an adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Texas in San Antonio, uh, working uh, very closely with Dr. DeFranco and sometimes with me when I was uh, over there. So uh, since 2012, uh, she, uh, she founded the Fatty Liver Group uh, for the European Association of the Study of Diabetes. She's also the chair of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes uh, on Insulin Resistance. Uh, she directed the European chapter of the American College of Nutrition. She's a member of the Board of American College of Nutrition, and she helped write the European Guidelines on Fatty Liver Disease. Um, she is a world-known expert in insulin secretion, insulin resistance, fatty liver. Uh, she has more than 300 original articles. Uh, she says 17,000 citations. My goodness. I mean, are you, publishing <laughs> in, are you publishing in China? What is this? So many, re no. So all, most of our publications are in very high impact factor journals. Um, she has 25 years of experience. She has many, many grants. Uh, but perhaps what I love the most of Amalia has been always very successful, very humble. We've been friends. We were uh, since 1999 when she came to San Antonio for the first time. I was looking before uh, introducing her. We published 13 papers together. We have another one that we hopefully will get published next month. It's just fun to, to hear uh, what Amalia has to say. And, uh, and we've shared many dinners at meetings. So thank you, Amalia, for making time. It's about 10 p.m. in Italy. So next time we definitely are gonna have it uh, uh, with a formal, real uh, human uh, contact visit here. So this is just an introduction. So thank you, Amalia, for, for uh, taking the time to do this. Thank you, Ken, for the nice introduction. It's a really a pleasure for me to, uh, to be here to talk with you, uh, to, with you all. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we I cannot meet you live, but I really hope I will have uh, the uh, possibility to do it uh, soon. Let me just uh, share my presentation. I have a special feeling for Gainesville because uh, while I was doing uh, my, my PhD in Galveston, at the same time, my husband was doing uh, 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 his uh, PhD in, uh, in Gainesville, uh, so I was going to visit uh, uh, Gainesville uh, every other month, so it's, uh, it's a city that I would love to go back. So uh, today, uh, the, the title of my talk is Pancreas Liver Crosstalk. I added the interregulation of glucose homeostasis and in the context of novel D. These, uh, let me see, these are my disclosure. And um, so I start with uh, this uh, um, slide that uh, came from uh, one of the, the last paper I, I wrote with, uh, with Dr. Kuzi. So it's, um, uh, and it's coming also as a, as a um, um, redrawn as something that uh, uh, Dr. Refronso has, um, has published you know, several years ago. And is the sort of natural history of type 2 diabetes uh, with the uh, increase uh, in insulin secretion to overcome uh, the reduction in insulin sensitivity, beta cell dysfunction, and when there is this beta cell failure, there is uh, the development of hyperglycemia. Uh, of course, you know, measuring insulin secretion uh, and um, beta cell function, it's very important to uh, 
uh, to find out what is uh, the risk of type 2 diabetes. And uh, especially in the field of NAFLD, uh, there are not many publications that, that has uh, uh, looked at the um, uh, beta cell function in, in this population, despite the fact that, that most of the uh, NAFLD patients uh, have a high risk of type 2 diabetes, and uh, in type 2 diabetic patients, uh, the prevalence of NAFLD is very high. So first of all, I'd like to, to start uh, saying that uh, the liver plays a central role in maintaining glucose homeostasis. And uh, it's uh, unfortunately that uh, in uh, the diabetic field, uh, uh, it's, there is a lot of attention to organs other than uh, the liver. So there is a lot of attention to the heart, to the kidney, to the pancreas, uh, um, to peripheral nerve, to the brain. But usually the liver is not considered one of the organs uh, that should be monitored. While instead uh, the liver is one of the main organs also to maintain glucose homeostasis, not only because it is the main site of glucose production or, and also of uh, the novel lipogenesis, but also because uh, the insulin and the glucagon that are secreted, uh, uh, mainly response to changes in glucose concentration, are uh, uh, secreted in the portal vein and uh, then they, are, um, they reach the liver as a first organ. And then only after they go uh, to in the periphery and also the insulin is acting in other organ like uh, uh, the muscle. So in the liver pancreas cross talk, uh, I would like today to focus my presentation mainly on uh, insulin secretion and uh, insulin, hepatic insulin clearance, uh, because otherwise it would be too long also to talk about uh, uh, hepatic insulin resistance and, um, and uh, the or also of glucagon, uh, maybe next time. So in the crosstalk between pancreas and liver, it is very important, the crosstalk is very important for both uh, hepatic and peripheral metabolism, and not only for glucose, but also for lipid and protein. That is why the disruption in this crosstalk increases the risk of type 2 diabetes. And uh, it's important insulin secretion, and it's important to quantify the flux of insulin uh, secretion. And of course, uh, um, there are several methods. Uh, Ken today asked me to give you a brief, um, uh, brief look to how we measure uh, insulin secretion and the beta cell function. So how do we measure insulin secretion? Um, insulin, as I said, is uh, secreted by the pancreas uh, in, uh, at the basal state, but mainly in response to uh, changes in glucose, so like after a meal or after a glucose load, and is secreted in the portal vein, is rich in the liver, where most about like 60% is degraded on the first pass, and then is going to uh, out to the peripheral circulation of through the hepatic vein, and then is coming back and recycled through the hepatic artery. Uh, C-peptide instead that is um, uh, secreted in equimolar way to insulin because uh, the pancreas uh, uh, secretes pro-insulin that then is cut to C-peptide and insulin is not uh, clear by the liver. So we use C-peptide to, um, to look and to measure pre-hepatic uh, uh, pre uh, insulin secretion. However, you know, the C-peptide uh, concentration are a good surrogate of insulin secretion, but what is very important is to measure the flux, so the picomol per minute that are secreted. So to do this, uh, we need a model, a mathematical model that uh, uh, allow us to go from the C-peptide, that is the output of the model, and then to find a way to look at the, the input of the model, that is the insulin secretion. And um, uh, in one of the, my first PhD, I did my training with uh, Professor Claudio Cobelli in Padova, that is uh, an expert in mathematical model. And this was actually um, him that sent me to, um, to Galveston to then learn about uh, stable isotope tracers. So right now, what we do is in my lab, we put together the mathematical model, the tracer kinetics, and in order to have a good, um, a good look at the, the um, glucose and the other metabolite uh, kinetics and uh, find out which are the, um, the mechanisms that are not working and are uh, um, uh, 
that are responsible for the hyperglycemia or other metabolic diseases. So we use this uh, uh, mathematical model to estimate the insulin secretion rate, and uh, we use the um, parameters uh, that uh, the population parameters that were initially uh, published by Van Kouter and Polonsky back in 1992. Unfortunately, we cannot have individual parameters because uh, at that time uh, they were using uh, labeled C peptide to look at individual parameters. Uh, right now, there are um, not this kind of radioactive tracer to do this, but the, the population parameters are good enough to have a good estimation of the flux. So this is one of the examples. Uh, so you see here the, sorry, the, the glucose concentration. In blue, you have the uh, diabetic with higher glucose. In green, the IGT, and in red, the controls. And these are the insulin concentration. And this is the flux in a picomol per minute per square meters um, that are um, for these uh, uh, three groups uh, of, uh, of subject. You see here that as for the insulin, the insulin secretory rate is much lower in the diabetic, but uh, the uh, controls and uh, the NGT and the IGT, they do have a similar, uh, in this case, a similar cons uh, insulin secretory uh, rate uh, until the 60 minutes, and then the IGT, since uh, they have a higher glucose, they still have a residual uh, insulin secretion. With the model, you can also estimate per space insulin secretion, the uh, dose response of the glucose to insulin secretory rate, that is a sort of second phase of insulin secretion, and the potentiation. It's too much for today, so because I want to focus more on the insulin clearance, so um, I just skip this part. Um, it's very important to, to look at insulin secretion, but uh, and also when we have used in the past uh, and also today this disposition index uh, that is uh, the product of uh, insulin response and insulin sensitivity because the disposition index has been shown to be related to the risk of type 2 diabetes because as subject keep uh, <clears throat> to, uh, to have a high secretory, increase their secretory capacity uh, to overcome the insulin, insulin resistance, then they, became, they remain NGT or they remain IGT. But when this is not happening, then the glucose tolerance decreases, becomes impaired, and they go from NGT to IGT to type 2 diabetes. Actually, uh, we have shown with Ralph that uh, um, to the good way to look at uh, uh, this uh, disposition index is not to use using uh, uh, pre-hepatic uh, insulin secretion or uh, the C-peptide, but just uh, the, the post-hepatic uh, um, insulin response and so the um, insulin concentration. And uh, so the disposition index, the correct way to look at this is uh, the uh, insulin response, for example, the IUC of insulin, delta IUC after the, uh, the OGD. That works, that works for me. That's easy. I, I can definitely send that in uh, today. And then, um, yeah, I was planning on tomorrow just giving a call. Oh, okay. It's not for me, I think. Hey, Clayton, uh, Clayton um, I think you need to mute your... Yeah, well, yeah, it just seems like, you know, Lauren, can you mute for, for from myself, there? Um, yeah, I'm looking ahead myself and then my kids for dental. I'm looking at myself, uh, kids, and wife. I don't have it. Um, right then, but I also noticed there's prescription plans and then there's the medical health flexibility <laughs> spending account. Can you mute everybody? I don't have control to, I'm trying to mute everybody. I'm trying to get a sense of everything. Um, and it's, it's definitely a little tricky. So... I, uh, I also don't have controls. What about you? Who who is the host? Aren't you, Mark? I'm the host. Let me see if going out. You can mute everybody. Can do it. I cannot find. Stop sharing. Maybe let me just see if I can uh, mute everybody. Mute all. Okay. Okay. So let me. There we go. Okay, back. Here we are. 
Okay, disposition index. So we need to, to look at uh, insulin response to have the good, uh, um, the correct uh, disposition index. Um, when uh, uh, recently we have looked at uh, the effect of um, uh, different liver diseases on glucose and insulin response, so the impact of this. And uh, we look, uh, so we study four different types of subjects, NGT that were insulin sensitive, NGT with insulin resistance, uh, those with um, chronic hepatitis C, and those with NAFLD, all non-diabetics. So you can see here that uh, more or less uh, um, at 120 minutes, uh, uh, the subjects uh, were, uh, they had very similar um, glucose uh, concentrations. So they, of course, you know, they had a, a worse tolerance of the uh, insulin resistance and the chronic uh, um, hepatitis C and NAFLD. And uh, what is interesting is the 60 minutes glucose tended to be a little bit higher in uh, those with, uh, that are insulin resistant, but also those with uh, liver disease. But uh, also very interesting is that uh, they are the NAFLD that have the highest uh, uh, insulin concentration. And uh, when we look, uh, we calculated the indexes of the insulin sensitivity and uh, the uh, insulin uh, response as an uh, incremental curve of uh, um, area under the curve of insulin over glucose. We found that, that uh, insulin, the chronic hepatitis C, they were actually more sensitive, is uh, even a little bit more sensitive than uh, the insulin. Uh, uh, the NGT insulin sensitive, while the NAFLD is expected and uh, the NGTIR, they were, uh, they had a, uh, they have a lower sensitivity. Uh, regarding the glucose ins stimulating insulin release was higher in the NAFLD and was instead a decrease uh, in uh, compared to their glucose uh, to the chronic hepatitis C. However, the chronic hepatitis C, they, they kept their, um, their glucose tolerance. So disposition index, uh, that was also an interesting uh, uh, found because uh, as expected the NGT IR, they had a lower disposition index, but uh, the NGT um, chronic uh, hepatitis C, NGT uh, was uh, a little bit uh, higher the NGT IR, and while the IGT was, uh, uh, a little, was like half of the NGT. And the NAFL instead, they have a much higher disposition index than uh, um, tended to be higher, though was not significant, than the NGT insulin sensitive. And of course, it was decreasing in the NASH, it tended to decrease in the NASH and uh, with presence of IGT. So when we look at the hyperbolic curve, you could see that uh, um, actually, the uh, NAFL, if they can maintain their insulin secretion and the insulin, uh, peripheral insulin concentration, even if they are more uh, insulin resistant, they are actually on a, on a curve that is uh, above the one of insulin uh, and sensitive uh, without NAFLD, NGT without NAFLD. Um, and uh, so it's, it doesn't seem that NAFLD per se is increasing uh, uh, the risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, so if it is not novel, and uh, you see here are the NAT NGT NASH, and you see they are in the same curve as uh, NGT insulin sensitive, so probably is, uh, it could be something else. So it's not steatosis, maybe they are the fibrosis or something else. So we uh, also uh, are now looking in other population to try to, to answer this question. Um, regarding again the disposition index, uh, this is uh, a study that uh, I published uh, in, with the San Antonio Metabolism Study with Ralph uh, back in uh, 2004. Maybe you remember this uh, uh, graph because it's also in his Claude Bernard uh, lecture and is where we have uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, in the IGT that uh, they have already uh, an 80% decrease in the disposition index uh, indicating that uh, they have already a major um, beta cell function, loss in beta cell function. 
and uh, using the disposition index that is normalizing the insulin response to insulin resistance, uh, the obese and non-obese overlap. And this is only um, uh, then related to, um, to the glucose tolerance and the two hour uh, glucose concentration. So these are completely new data that um, uh, we have just uh, presented at the ADA, and uh, I hope we'll be able to publish soon. So this is a, a large cohort uh, in collaboration with uh, the University of Antwerp, where we had uh, uh, subjects with, with BMI was below 40, so we excluded those with the morbid obesity. Uh, they all had a liver biopsy, so with, they were then uh, divided in groups uh, with uh, no NAFOL and liver biopsy, NAFOL, NASH fibrosis 01 or NASH fibrosis 2 and 4. So if you look at the disposition index, as expected, the disposition index decreases with the uh, uh, glucose intolerance. So the IGT, um, they have a lower uh, disposition index and uh, this is decreasing also in type 2 diabetic, but especially it's interesting that is the NASH with fibrosis 2-4 are the one that have in all groups a significantly lower disposition index is even half in the NGT compared to the non-NAFL and also to the NAFL. Uh, and I think this is a, an interesting uh, result because it's also um, important because uh, if uh, type 2 diabetic patients uh, have a decrease in uh, disposition index, even if uh, they are NGT, maybe they should, uh, oh, sorry, if they are diabetic patients or subject with NGT that have a, a low disposition index, they should be checked uh, for um, presence of uh, NAFL NASH because this could be related also to the, uh, the liver dysfunction could be uh, also related to the, uh, to the impairment in uh, insulin secretion and insulin resistance. So it is generally believed that the increase in plasma insulin response derives from the ability of a beta cell to read the severity of total body insulin resistance and adjust this secretion appropriately to offset the defects in insulin action. So to have like, a, when you have like a low disposition in this. However, the plasma insulin response represents the sums of the beta insulin secretory rate and the, the metabolic clean rate of insulin. So the, um, the in peripheral insulin concentration, the one we, uh, we measure in um, peripheral plasma is actually um, the, um, the represent the sums of uh, the insulin secretory rate and the clearance. So going back to the initial uh, cartoon here, uh, what will be uh, the sites of uh, insulin degradation are the liver and also there is peripheral degradation at the muscle, but there is also the, the kidney. So the liver is really playing uh, a major role here because uh, it is modulating the amount of insulin that reaches the circulation. So the question now is, is um, the clearance uh, uh, a, static, um, a static mechanism, so the clearance, uh, uh, we know that there are studies showing that the clearance uh, is decreased in NAFLD, are decreased uh, in subject with NAFLD, and this is, uh, can be increased or is can be modulated. So, and also how do we measure insulin extraction and clearance? So here is, uh, the method we are using right now. I put the, the easy method and then I will uh, go back to the, uh, to the mathematical model. So of course, you know, here we have the liver, uh, the secretion of uh, insulin into the portal vein. Then you have uh, the delivery that is actually the secretion plus the recirculation through the hepatic vein. And then, you know, you have uh, the mixture in the, the peripheral pool and the clearance uh, here by the muscle and uh, the kidneys while there is also an hepatic extraction. So the total clearance that we can measure is actually the balance between the, the sum of the clearance in the periphery and the clearance in the liver. So we need to know uh, the input that is the insulin secretory rate. So for these things, so we need to use the model of C-peptide. That, that, uh, that's why I started with the insulin secretion. So by the model of encounter, we can measure insulin secretion and then uh, we we can then use some formula to calculate uh, insulin clearance. 
So if we just wanted to know what is the insulin clearance during a test like the OGTT, this is uh, how you can calculate the extraction, that is uh, area under the curve of the insulin secretion minus uh, the changes in insulin times the volume of distribution. Of course, you know, remember that if, you, uh, if your test uh, in your insulin going, is going back to, to the level of, of fasting, this uh, term will be zero, so will be just uh, the extraction at the, during the uh, during the test will be exactly as the, as a, as a, the sum of um, of the insulin secreted during the test, and the clearance instead is uh, the insulin extraction divided by insulin. Actually, the formula is a little bit complicated because you need to calculate at each time point the insulin secretion divided by insulin. Most of the formula, they just divide the area under the curve of insulin secretory rate divided by area under the curve of insulin. But there is like an intrinsic error in that, that we can result in like a 5 to 15 percent um, underestimation. But uh, um, this is uh, too complicated for this time uh, of, the, of the evening for me. Uh, so these are... Uh, um, the, the model and uh, these are uh, uh, new data that are now under uh, revision in, uh, in diabetes. So what we did is we measure insulin secretion at each time point during the OGTT. And these are the non obese. I start with this because uh, as expected that the diabetic that are the white triangle, they have a lower insulin secretion during the OGTT. Here the NGT and the IGT in this group uh, that has similar, um, uh, similar uh, uh, insulin secretion rates. And obese as expected, they have a much higher insulin secretion and uh, the IGT obese uh, were a little bit lower than uh, the NGT and of course uh, the diabetic were uh, significantly lower. Insulin, uh, you see here, the insulin especially, you can see in uh, here that uh, they are uh, much higher in the IGT while the insulin secretion was going down. This is an index that uh, um, the clearance is, uh, is changing over time. And also here, there is a little bit of difference, but we cannot appreciate here. So by using uh, the um, the modeling of the, the clearance, we calculated the clearance over time. So this is was sort of uh, expected and unexpected. There are several, um, several studies that have shown, even in the past, that the insulin clearance is decreased during the, uh, the meal of your GDP. So insulin clearance is not constant over the day, but is actually changing. Uh, when, uh, with the increase uh, in insulin secretion. Uh, this is the first thing. The change is actually happening very soon. You know, in, 50, uh, in the 15, 30 minutes, you already have a decrease in insulin clearance and the insulin clearance stays down. Uh, what's another um, interesting and unexpected finding is that the non obese diabetic, they actually did not change their insulin, secretion, uh, insulin clearance. While the obese diabetic, they have a decrease in insulin clearance, but was also much higher than uh, the, the other um, two groups, the obese NGT and IGT. Uh, instead, the insulin extraction is uh, more or less uh, um, following the insulin secretory rate. So you have like a, a higher extraction. So the, the amount of insulin that is extracted altogether from the liver and the peripheral tissue is um, uh, much higher in NGT and IGT, but is lower than in the obese because also, as if you remember here, the insulin secretion was lower. So it's more or less following uh, the insulin uh, secretion. Um, so uh, this uh, decrease in insulin clearance results in a higher peripheral insulin concentration. And I, we think that that is the liver that can in some way has some signal in which is also uh, modulating the amount of insulin in the periphery. And makes sense because if the liver is clearing like 60% of insulin, why you need to have an extra um, uh, insulin uh, beta cell uh, response and secretion by the pancreas while you can just decrease uh, your, uh, uh, the clearance of the liver to leave uh, more um, insulin in the periphery. 
and uh, the metabolic clearance rate, uh, this was calculated during the CLAMP that was uh, done in the same subject. You see here is uh, strongly correlated the decrease with the adipose tissue insulin resistance, with hepatic insulin resistance, uh, especially with the muscle insulin resistance. So those uh, that have a higher uh, insulin resistance in the muscle, liver, or adipose tissue, they also have uh, a decreased clearance. So, uh, this is uh, necessary to overcome uh, insulin resistance or at least to try to overcome insulin resistance. Uh, now I'm going back to uh, NAFLD to see uh, what is the impact to have uh, you know, steatosis and um, liver damage on insulin secretion and uh, clearance. Um, it has been shown not only by us, uh, this is a, a paper from the group of um, Tina Wiesbo and uh, Lick Knopp. They also show that uh, the subject with NAFLD, they have higher insulin and also higher insulin secretion. And uh, this is a study that was just published in uh, Diabetes, Obesity and Metabolism. They also found the uh, same things that we did in, uh, with the decrease of uh, insulin clearance after the OGDT, but also that uh, the NAFLD, they have a lower insulin clearance, especially during uh, the OGTT, and the insulin clearance was also negatively associated with the hepatic insulin resistance index. Um, going back to the um, to the uh, group, to the cohort that we are studying uh, with uh, the group in Antwerp, Professor Frank and uh, Dr. Vongia. Um, these are uh, the subjects that uh, you see, they are over 300, uh, 341. And uh, the insulin concentration are much higher in uh, uh, subject that uh, they have uh, fibrosis 2-4. Uh, especially NGT and IGT, while they are not significantly different in the type 2 diabetic. And the hepatic insulin secretion rate, they were also tended to be higher as a subject were going from uh, non awful to NAFL, NASH, and to fibrosis um, uh, 0, 1 to 2, 4, with the, the highest in the group with NASH and uh, um, worse fibrosis. And uh, However, you know, there are other uh, studies that didn't see uh, the relationship with uh, uh, hepatic fat. This is a study by Dr. Steve Kahn and uh, Uschneider that was published last year. They, they use the model that um, was developed by David Polidori and was published in Diabetes. And they use um, uh, this model where they, the model is um, um, assuming that there is a, a saturation in the hepatic uh, uh, insulin clearance. And so they found that the fractional insulin clearance was decreased during the OGTD and was even more decreased in the subject with NAFOL, but there was no correlation with the amount of fat in, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the liver. And that is completely different from what other group has, uh, has found. This is the first study where we published, we were the first to publish this. This was a paper that we, I, I published with Ken in gastroenterology. And uh, then there was uh, the paper by Anna Kotronen with uh, Hanele Giarvinen, the next day we are after us. And that this is uh, the paper that uh, Dr. Kuzi with Fernando Brill has uh, published uh, using the ratio of C-peptide to insulin. But you know, you can see here that there is a decrease uh, with NASH and um, from simple steatosis to NASH. Um, so uh, going to the, to, the, to the insulin clearance in this group, you see that uh, um, despite they have a highest uh, insulin secretion and insulin, um, they have also the, the subject with NASH fibrosis before, they have the lowest insulin clearance. And there is uh, this uh, trend to go down. You see it in all the three, um, the three um, glucose tolerance uh, um, uh, group. So uh, actually there is a difference between uh, in glucose tolerance group in obesity, but also in severity of liver disease that is affecting uh, the insulin uh, clearance. 
And uh, yes, and this is instead of the prehepatic uh, insulin secretion rate. So the highest the prehepatic insulin secretion rate, also the lowest uh, the, uh, the insulin uh, clears here. That is quite uh, uh, unexpected, uh, let's say this. Uh, this is instead is the study that um, uh, Sam Klein has, is, uh, has published uh, this year in uh, JCI. And uh, they also used the, um, the model by David Polidori, and they also found uh, that uh, there was an increase in insulin secretion in obese NASH. Uh, I calculated the hepatic extraction was actually a little bit lower in, um, in the subject with uh, obesity, uh, obesal NAFOL D compared to non NAFOL obese. But you see here the hepatic extraction was uh, uh, higher, and this was due to mainly to the high insulin secretion rate. And also the uh, peripheral uh, clearance, uh, the peripheral extraction was uh, much higher, actually three times uh, higher than, uh, um, than uh, the group uh, with obese uh, without an apple. And uh, these are uh, data that uh, are um, uh, interesting, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's a little bit different from uh, what uh, has been uh, published uh, before. And uh, this is also because, uh, sorry, in this, uh, in this model, most of the data that in order to be um, modeled, they require to have like a saturation, a, an hypothesis of saturation of hepatic uh, um, insulin extraction. So like uh, they have an increase in insulin secretion, but uh, this exceeds the capacity of uh, the liver to uh, to clear the, the insulin, that's why they had, uh, this was the hypothesis, they why you had a much higher um, insulin uh, in, uh, in uh, the periphery. Uh, although they didn't publish, uh, uh, they didn't calculate uh, the fasting uh, insulin uh, clearance and the insulin secretion, so it's difficult to see if there was like a, a decrease. Um, it's difficult to think that we have uh, um, a saturation with this uh, um, type of uh, insulin, circulating insulin, because uh, the data that uh, has been uh, published here is uh, the paper by Ferranini and the Fronto in uh, published a long time ago in uh, 1983, where they catheterized uh, the um, hepatic vein and they did the splanchnic and peripheral uh, uh, extraction. Uh, you can see that uh, the, there was like a, a plateau in extraction when uh, insulin was uh, reaching uh, 500 to 600 milliunit per liter. And it's quite uh, supraphysiological. It's very unlike, unlikely to, to see this concentration unless uh, it's possible in some of the subjects that they did um, uh, the bariatric surgery and then they have a high response to OGD. They maybe arrive to some of these uh, uh, high concentration, but not in, uh, in obese, uh, in the, the normal obese, although they have a very high concentration. Um, also, the binding uh, to, of uh, insulin to liver metabolism, I went back to this uh, uh, old, very, very old uh, study from uh, Ron Khan, uh, they brought, and uh, you see that the mice that were uh, obese and hyperglycemic, uh, they had a reduction in binding in the liver, uh, but uh, they, uh, they, it's, the binding is increasing and not decreasing during uh, the OGDT, and is increasing much more in those that were thinner than in the obese. So it's, it's strange, I mean, uh, the the lack of binding cannot explain the decrease in, uh, in insulin clearance that uh, we, we, can, we see in, um, uh, in uh, these uh, subjects. So uh, this is a model that uh, Polidori has used. Uh, and uh, I just put this because uh, I wanted you to, uh, to understand that some of the study that I show you, the Utsunider and the Smith study, they use this model and to calculate hepatic clearance and the hepatic structure. But this has some assumption and especially because the delivery, so whatever comes to the liver from the portal vein or uh, from uh, the hepatic artery as a recycle is uh, the insulin secretion plus uh, the hepatic bl plasma flow and the time of the uh, insulin concentration. The hepatic plasma flow has uh, been um, considered a constant, so this could be, um, could be uh, one of the uh, bias, but I, I don't think this is um, Polidori did a, a sensitivity study should be, should be uh, the 
a big, um, big um, um, for, uh, source of error or a variability. Uh, well, that the, the hepatic structure that could be modeled either uh, in linear ways, so with a constant fractional extraction, or with a, a saturable model like a Michaelis Menten. Uh, while uh, the extrahepatic insulin degradation is always uh, um, proportional to the amount of insulin that is in the periphery. And this has been uh, um, quite uh, shown by by several studies. So this is a, a, an hypothesis that is uh, holding. This one instead, um, it could be uh, an assumption that is forcing the system to go to in a certain direction just to, uh, to, to model the data. And that, that could, uh, of course, uh, explain why um, some, of the, uh, some of the data just to show they are different from the rest of the uh, of what was published uh, using uh, no modeling a uh, no modeling approach um, also um, just to see that i i don 't believe that there is really a an hepatic uh, a saturation of the hepatic extraction. I found that this article from the group of Charrington they actually did the portal infusion or a portal high or a, um, peripheral high or peripheral um, high half so they can have uh, the same uh, concentration uh, here as um, uh, in the arterial and the, the, in the, the hepatic sinusoidal. So um, you see here, especially with the portal, to have a much higher hepatic uh, concentration of insulin compared to the periphery. And uh, uh, here it is, the liver to periphery ratio is uh, this one. But the hepatic extraction is very similar across the three studies. So I think that even if here they have a very high um, insulin uh, in, uh, in, the, in the liver that uh, did not affect uh, the uh, fractional hepatic structure, although it affected, it was uh, increasing the insulin clearance and uh, the net uh, hepatic uh, uptake. So the, um, the, I think the hypothesis to have uh, a uh, saturable uh, um, mechanism is probably something that is uh, needed to be uh, revisited and maybe change something in that model. Um, so what I did, and this was uh, just a sort of a last uh, thing uh, that uh, I've done uh, just to look, uh, I wanted to see in this group uh, of Antwerp uh, with the IGT, NGT, uh, type 2 diabetic with a different uh, degree of uh, severity on NAFL and NASH, it was interesting to find that, that um, IGT had a much higher clearance here, the non-AFL, but all the, uh, the subjects with uh, NAFL, NASH, or fibrosis has a much lower clearance. And actually, the clearance was uh, the lowest in those uh, with uh, NASH fibrosis 2.4, and this was true in the NGT and IGT. And you see also here in the type 2 diabetics. Again, even in this cohort, we see a decrease in um, insulin clearance that uh, start uh, already in the first uh, 30 minutes and then uh, remain low. So this is uh, something that is um, happening in uh, um, early and uh, it's maintained. And is also uh, interesting because uh, um, despite the fact that uh, uh, the insulin secretion is then going down, then we still have a low, um, uh, a low clearance. So in summary, uh, subject with NAFLD have increased insulin during fasting and postprandial state, decreased insulin clearance, uh, decreased disposition index, uh, and for this reason, an increased uh, risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. So in uh, this, uh, um, in this um, cartoon uh, with the uh, history of type 2 diabetes, uh, it's important now to look at the insulin clearance because insulin clearance is the one modulating uh, the amount of insulin that is, can be uh, necessary to overcome insulin sensitivity. So the decrease in insulin clearance, uh, it's, it's an important mechanism uh, for um, uh, also for the risk to take into account the risk of uh, uh, and progression of type 2 diabetes. So I'd like uh, to thank you uh, all for the attention. And this is uh, my group and uh, also the uh, collaboration. Uh, it's, it's very uh, important for me, Ralph, and of course, you know, Ken and Fernando for uh, the things that we have done together and also the 
other group, uh, Isabetta Bugianesi, University of Torino, Gertrude Mingrone, University Catholic University, and uh, Sam Frank, uh, Luvan Kalle, Luisa Vongia, and the Antwerp uh, University. Thank you for your attention. Very good. I mean, as expected, Amalia, a uh, uh, few people would be able to manage all the metabolism you've packed in an hour. So I am very impressed and I'm going, I have questions, but I, I would like to open it to, to the floor. I mean, yeah, anybody who has questions, just- uh, Please uh, unmute or type in the chat. Yeah, or if you have any questions you wanna send me, but if not, just, just speak up. So- Can I have a question? It's-, it's Go for it. Uh, Roy Kulkani from Jocelyn. Uh, that Hi, is, Roy. Uh, that is we met in, in uh, San Antonio, I think a couple of years ago. Yes, you're right. It's, it's great to see you and a uh, great talk. Uh, I, I was curious about two points. One is whether you see any differences in gender between the, in, in the context of clearance versus secretion, whether females are different from males. And the second question, which I think is more speculative, uh, can you uh, discuss what could be the potential factors which are contributing to this enhanced secretion in the natural D cases? Thanks. Ah, two difficult questions. No, we haven't looked at uh, the, um, uh, the difference also because in gender, because most of the, uh, as you know, the NAFLD is mainly, it's more prevalent in men, especially in uh, uh, the moderate obese. And then you have then the morbid obese where you have especially women. And um, so it's, um, I think also they are two different type of NAFLD, usually the, the lean and the obese, uh, they, tr they often have like a, a more severe fibrosis while the morbid obese, uh, they usually have fibrosis uh, zero, one, two, but they never go to three and four. Um, so I haven't done the gender, but this will, I, will, uh, I will look uh, very soon, and thank you for the suggestion. Uh, regarding why they have an increase in uh, insulin secretory response, uh, I have no idea. In the, and there was a sort of a surprise because uh, everybody was just thinking that uh, since there is this risk of, novel, of type 2 diabetes uh, that is... Uh, very clear in the epidemiology. Uh, I was just thinking there was a sort of impairment in uh, beta cell function or first phase, uh, but uh, none of the studies uh, that has been published or uh, and they really found anything uh, particularly um, uh, related uh, to this. And so uh, I don't know if there is a, um, uh, there is a something, uh, well, they could have like a better, uh, uh, beta cell uh, or just, you know, the lipotoxicity, uh, the real lipotoxicity is, uh, it's only in, uh, in the liver because uh, there are the studies from uh, um, Roy Taylor showing that uh, there is a, a subject that have uh, the uh, hepatic fat, they also have uh, pancreatic fat. But actually the problem is not that the fat is if the fat, fat is becoming toxic. So if you progress from now simple NAFOL to NASH, and there are not many studies where you have also liver biopsies. So it's, um, uh, it's something we are trying to explore. And now we have also some uh, in this uh, in a subgroup of this cohort with um, bar styles, uh, we have also the transcriptomic of the liver biopsy. So we are trying to mix now and to try to see at least if uh, the liver can tell us uh, something more. Thank you. Okay, since I'm going to uh, elbow my way to a question here. So, so Amalia, uh, well, we probably will talk more um, soon about all of this, but the, the, one of the striking findings is it's not just NASH, but those with, um, in the slides, for those who are not in the NASH field, it said F24 is fibrosis moderate to advanced compared to those at F1, which is very mild. So they all have NASH, uh, but it seems that the degree of fibrosis uh, makes things worse. So um, why, why, you must have thought about this. I mean, I keep thinking, why would this be? Do they have a longer duration of diabetes as, you know, unprecise it is to estimate duration of diabetes? Have you thought about um, the fibrosis will be a marker of 
long-term disease or? I have no I idea. I'm because trying to put this, the hypothesis together. In this cohort, these were, I forgot to tell you, these were a newly diagnosed diabetic. Mm. So because that they did the GDT, the yes. Yes, so they did your GDT because uh, they were not, uh, um, they didn't know if they had or not diabetes. So these are all uh, newly diagnosed diabetics uh, without, of course, any med medication. So it's, uh, it's harder to, to say, uh, to answer your question. Uh, but I think, you know, it's, um, it's something we, we should explore because, uh, of course, you know, it's, uh, it would be important. So this brings another, I'm stealing everybody's mm -hmm. questions, but this promise after this, I'll let uh, anybody else talk. Because this would link, there is some work from your, your colleagues there, Targer and others, suggesting that if you have NASH, you or even with fibrosis, you get more cardiovascular disease than simple stetosis or whatever, which is controversial too. But uh, this hyperinsulinemia, you think uh, is also linked to that, uh, is that the link between worse cardiovascular disease and is that? Correct? I think only if you have uh, like uh, also uh, secretion of uh, uh, of uh, toxic lipids. So uh, the hyperinsulinemia alone, I don't think it makes uh, a big uh, uh, a big impact. Uh, I think you know if you have like a dysfunctional adipose tissue, that means you know you have. A, the FFA going to the liver and then FFA becomes not only triglyceride, they could become ceramides, they could become uh, other toxic lipids. Uh, so uh, I think that in that case, uh, you, could, uh, you could have like uh, uh, the combination, I think it's the combination of insulin with the other metabolites, not the insulin itself or the fatty acid itself. And uh, of course, you know, it's like, um, and then if you drive the novel lipogenesis, of course, you make a more saturated fatty acids. We know the harmful effect of. Uh, so you think that this worse fibrosis and hyperinsulinemia by some mechanism is also linking it to atherogenesis to some extent? I think so. I mean, uh, there is, uh, of course, you know, uh, we know that, that uh, um, excess LDL, excess cholesterol uh, is linked to uh, cardiovascular disease. And they all are, uh, I mean, we know that the dietary uh, cholesterol is not really the one that is uh, harmful. So it has to be made by the liver or the, you know, the clearance of uh, uh, LDL, it could be, you know, uh, everything related to cholesterol metabolism. Uh, LXR, for example, that uh, are now, now uh, studied is, um, is of course, one of the uh, mechanisms for cholesterol synthesis and oxidation. Oxidized cholesterol, now it's uh, is the one that uh, people are looking not only for the liver, but also the periphery. So it's really possible that uh, there are uh, a combination of mechanisms, not only uh, not only one, I mean, and of course we know insulin is uh, driving the collagen formation. So it, that could be many mechanisms where insulin- That could be one mechanism, be, uh, yeah. Okay, very good. We have a question here from Julio. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, Julio, okay. Uh, <laughs> Julio, do you wanna ask it directly yourself <laughs> since you're there somewhere? The question is, any comments about clearance of insulin in different populations such as gestational diabetes? I think, you know, every time uh, you have uh, insulin resistance and so on, and uh, so, or uh, diabetes, you have uh, a, a, a change in, um, a decrease in, uh, in insulin clearance. Uh, this, you know, insulin increasing insulin resistance and decreasing insulin clearance has been shown in, uh, in, different, uh, uh, in different groups uh, using different, uh, even surrogate methods. But, you know, it's, uh, the, the message is the same. Uh, I think, you know, if you wanted to find uh, small differences, maybe you need to use a model uh, and uh, to, to learn more about this, but uh, um, the, I mean, uh, the, the traditional method just using uh, C-peptide and insulin can give uh, uh, a good idea. I mean, especially when the differences are, are large. And uh, there are, of course, you know, the gestational diabetes uh, usually is uh, uh, 
um, is also associated with uh, reduction in clearance. I found that uh, also some drugs that are uh, very interesting because, uh, for example, pioglitazone is um, um, reducing, uh, um, uh, it's reducing insulin clearance, but is uh, stimulating, uh, it's uh, improving beta cell function and is reducing insulin. So you have also these other things that you reduce peripheral insulin, but you have like an increase in insulin secretion. And I remember a paper that uh, where we look at xenotide with David Alessio, where we found that uh, xenotide treatment was not increasing insulin secretion, but was uh, increasing insulin uh, uh, peripherally. So there was uh, for sure an a decrease in insulin clearance. So I see Richard is asking intermittent fasting affect clearance of the metabolism. This is a, an interesting uh, question. I don't have any data on uh, intermittent fasting. It would be nice uh, uh, to see it uh, also because uh, intermittent fasting, um, uh, it depends on the length, but it could, uh, for sure, it's affecting uh, liver metabolism and uh, ketone production and uh, driving, you know, shifting from glucose to to lipid metabolism. I have no idea, but it will be interesting to study that. Well, we tried to do an intermittent fasting study here with, um, with a faculty that came from Colorado and had done several of those. It's Troy Donahue, but he had to go and, and cover the inpatient. But we couldn't recruit anybody after like uh, months and months and months. So um, we gave up. Hard to do that in, in Florida. There are too many temptations. Well, yeah. actually, I'm, I'm still oh, there here. Oh, there you are, Troy. Uh, oh, I, I thought you were covering. I didn't see you. Okay. Um, and, and thanks to uh, my old friend and colleague, Rich, for throwing out the question. Um, uh, we worked together in Vermont many, many years ago. But uh, uh, where I first started, and Rich helped me with my first uh, couple of intermittent fasting patients, um, I, I think uh, your point about the duration is, is really very good because the one study that I did completed that I had started in Vermont um, was a, in essence a 36 hour every other day fast. And I think that's um, uh, both in, in very difficult to sustain, but also too long, but maybe a, more of the time restricted feeding with a window of four to six hours, um, as long as people are getting into that ketosis state might be something that's both sustainable and have additional metabolic benefits. Yeah, but I think the the question that Richard asked it's it's very uh, it's very interesting uh, because I I suspect that, that uh, for sure you are changing insulin clearance uh, you are changing the insulin response and uh, and you have an improvement in insulin sensitivity so I think how these are balanced. Uh, I, uh, I haven't looked in the literature about uh, the insulin secretion, but for sure it's a, it's a very uh, interesting question. Okay, well, we're almost on time. We're putting you to bed quite late tonight, Amalia. We worked you to death, and uh, you and me are going to keep talking about these things uh, as we finish that next uh, paper. So thank you all for, for attending. Thank you, Amalia, for um, a piece of art here this afternoon, and uh, we are uh, very grateful for your visit. And uh, Next Wednesday, we have Dr. Paolo Pergola from UT San Antonio. You know Paolo, I think, Amalia, a yes, nephrologist. Yes. He's going to talk about diabetic nephropathy. So you're all invited, and uh, we will continue having, uh, we have some good guests coming. Uh, Marin uh, is putting up an, a spectacular series of guests. And on Wednesday, we're going to have Dr. Goldberg talk about uh, the uh, diabetes prevention program. Dr. Busui from Michigan about neuropathy. But again, Amalia, thank you very much and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.